Okay, so for the last video in this series, we're going to do somewhat of a real-world deployment. Um, as you can tell, I removed all of my silver peaks here. Um, we're going to go ahead and modify all of our business intent overlays because in this scenario, I unfortunately am only going to have one ISP uh, per uh, silver peak. So um, in this scenario, obviously, we won't be able to see actual failover uh, of Internet traffic and utilization of multiple links, but it will be actual deployment uh, on VMware in AWS and Azure. So uh, the solution will consist of four sites. I have my lab here, which is, uh, I guess, going to be named home with a VMware infrastructure. I have a third party uh, out in California, um, Bare Metal uh, Sykes uh, is the name of the company, hardware that I've got an ESX host on that will deploy a VM on. And then I've got AWS and Azure. So it'll consist of four sites and all of them, of course, will only have one internet connection, but will be able to see some real-time data uh, the Sykes location has a Microsoft domain controller, as does my home, and uh, we should be able to see some data flowing back and forth for that, uh, as well as see some true latency from home here, which is Des Moines, Iowa, all the way to California, plus both of the cloud resources in AWS and Azure. So the first thing I'm going to do here is fix up my BIOS for this deployment. I need to, of course, remove my INET2 and leave INET1. My default, I'm going to set the high efficiency. Here, I am going to leave this alone. However, we do need to get rid of INET2 here as well. And then up through the rest of these. Don't need any cross connects now because we obviously don't have anything to cross connect to. I will leave the bulk apps as high quality. Get rid of INET2 over here. Critical apps is also high quality right now. And get rid of this. Actually, just so we have differences, let's make this high throughput. And then this guy, my voice, high availability. Get rid of the cross connect group. Not that there would be anything there anyway. I think I forgot to do that over here. We'll apply that. So we've got our real-time, INET1, high availability, high quality, high throughput, high efficiency. So everything here looks good. And now we need to talk about our templates, which I am going to go ahead and remove the templates that I created so that we can go through that process here. I probably won't delete Pacific Central and Eastern just because those only contain time zone data, etc. We'll leave those alone for now. The default template group, yeah, this is fine. DNS, that should be reachable. This actually, these servers actually live in my home uh, lab here, and they're the domain controllers as well. Everything else here should be okay. So first, let's talk a little bit about the design. If I go into my ESX environment here, my, my VMware environment here, we will see uh, the Sykes environment. I have an ESX host there that's currently reachable. I am connected to that via this Cisco FTD firewall, site-to-site uh, -site VPN between my home lab firewall here and in my home lab here, you can see this EVNG Pro. That was the VM that we were running the previous lab on. My actual orchestrator is a full-blown VM right here. 
uh, this lives in my land here. And in this scenario now, this would turn from kind of a cloud hosted or to an on-prem from, from the perspective of uh, orchestrator. So where I previously had it kind of pseudo out up in the internet in my uh, lab, now it's on-prem. So we can see here, I already deployed the VM for the Sykes site. And I also already deployed the VM for my local site here. It is this one here. And if we look at these, I simply created them with a couple of NICs and basic config. I don't need a whole lot of horsepower, right? I've only got 20 meg licenses. But I've got this, which will be the management zero interface. This will be my LAN, and this will be my internet. So uh, very similar at my home site. Now, from a connectivity perspective, I here at home sit on a one gig, uh, centrifugal one gig circuit from CenturyLink. I believe my Sykes solution has a one gig circuit uh, as well, or one gig throughput as well. Obviously, Amazon and AWS will be similar. So uh, again, my limitation in connectivity here will be uh, throughput on my 20 meg licenses from Silver Peak. So I don't really have to worry about that ships in the night solution that uh, or issue that we talked about in previous videos on Silver Peak seeing all the internet. So that being said, uh, when I set this up, this Sykes site, I am going to shut down this firewall. It will be the only connectivity in or out of that site. At my home site here, I am going to treat it more kind of like a data center where I will still have my firewall facing the internet. That's this here, a pair of FTDs uh, facing the internet. I am going to drop the LAN side of my Silver Peak into a network that hangs off of these, uh, that routes back to the rest of my network. So I will bring up uh, OSPF or BGP between these firewalls and the Silver Peak and let that advertise routes and data in and out of the solution. So here we'll have static routes, there we'll have a routing protocol in use, and then of course AWS and Azure will uh, likely also be static routes. So to get started, we'll start out here with the Sykes DC. I don't have any DHCP services running out here right now, so I will have to manually configure the Silver Peak with an address that I can hit the web interface on. So uh, keep in mind, I still have direct VPN connectivity to that site over the firewalls. So once I deployed this VM, if I launch the console, you'll see, unlike what I saw in the lab, I now have kind of GUI menu here that I can use to configure the appliance. So if I hit F4 to configure the management interface, I can see the first thing I need to do here is assign the MAC address to the management interface. Now, to figure out which interface I need, I have to go back to VMware. I'll edit this VM, and we'll take a look. It should be this one, so MAC address ending in 1E36, which is our first. So we'll assign that. Need to give it a static IP. My network there is 59 dot, and in this case, this will be 59.5. dot five. It's a 24 bit mask. 59.1. Now, 59.1 is currently the default gateway for this network, the land side interface of the firewall, and we'll get that swapped out here with this appliance as we go through this migration process. So. Click Apply to Reboot. That guy will go ahead and reboot. Now, while that's rebooting, we will go look at my home, Silver Peak, as well. Again, same menu. So the difference here is when I look at my networks, 
VLAN 50 is kind of my main LAN network uh, that this machine that I'm working on and doing the recording sits on. That's my management interface. This is the LAN site interface. It will drop into a Silver Peak lab. This happens to be the exact same network that the orchestrator lives on. And then, of course, I've got my internet connection here. In this scenario, the VLAN 50, where this management interface is, lives uh, through the firewall, essentially, from this Silver Peak lab, along with a number of other networks that will get advertised up to uh, the Silver Peak here. Another set of networks coming off of that firewall uh, happens to be a full-blown uh, Cisco uh, SDA uh, solution, so uh, part of my lab with uh, DNAC and SDA. So all of the networks from that should get advertised up here on the LAN site interface as well off of that firewall. So we should see plenty of networks and in, in real-time uh, information there. So we'll go ahead and launch this guy. Now you'll notice here this guy already grabbed a couple of IP addresses. One, it grabbed DHCP from my provider, and it also grabbed uh, DHCP from my LAN for the management interface, as well as DHCP from my Silver Peak network. So I don't even need to do anything here. And if this was actually a physical appliance with a serial number registered in my account, this thing would already show up and be ready to go. But being it's virtual, I still have to give it that licensing we talked about. So at this point, I should be able to hit 69.132. And here we are. Admin, admin, just like always. And sure enough, we are logged in. So really, all I have to do with this appliance now is essentially get the interfaces assigned and get MAC addresses assigned. So if I go to interfaces here, you can see nothing has been assigned. If I go to all interfaces, all of our MAC addresses are currently unassigned. We'll go ahead and get them assigned here quick. If I come back over to my VMware, take a look at this guy. I know that my management interface is going to be D5CB and my LAN side is 0BFE. And if I remember those, when I come over here, D5CB, and LAN 0, 0 BFE, leaving only one left to assign here. We'll apply that, save our changes, and we move this guy. Now, our other silver peak here that we just worked on remotely should have come up and sure enough 59.5 we try to go to that and there she came up now on this one there is, like I said, this initial config wizard. I can go here as well to give my assignments. And this also gives me the ability to change the host name and whatnot. So uh, we'll do this on this one. Uh, I can also do the licensing here too. I'm going to wait and do that uh, later. So we will call this guy sp-psychc-. O one, I believe I called it, and then for our land zero, that's this guy, seventy four A eight, and our land 
zero will obviously be that guy. We'll save that. I'm going to say no reboot later. Again, I'm sure that bug is gone by now, but old habits. And we'll reboot that guy. Jump back over here to the one that's at my house. Should be rebooted already. And here, I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing just to change the whole name. One. So now we have these two guys kind of minimally configured. I will need to go through and get them licensed and all of that kind of fun stuff. So I'm going to pause while I do the license um, just because I'm lazy and don't want to have to blur that information out uh, in the video. I'm literally going to do nothing other than go to this initial config wizard again and in this scenario put in the licensing for both of them. Okay, so they've both been licensed now. Now, keep in mind, as I've said in the past, as long as they have an internet connection on one of their interfaces, they should be able to get back to the cloud portal and ultimately to Orchestrator, even though they don't have any direct connectivity to Orchestrator. Well, I guess the one on-prem would because it's on the same local network, but the Sykes one would not. So. Coming back over here to Orchestrator, sure enough, right away, we see we found a couple of appliances, and here they are. We'll give these a minute to get fully connected here, and these approve buttons will go green. And at that point, um, we'll go through the onboarding process for them. But while we wait for that, again, we can go take a look at this, right, and look at our uh, administration Silverpeak so Cloud Portal and Orchestrator, we can see we are connected to the Cloud Portal. No connection to Orchestrator yet. In fact, we don't even know what the IP address of Orchestrator is yet. And this is my home, right? They live on the same land side. The management interface here is layer two adjacent to the Orchestrator. And then of course, Sykes, the remote data center, same thing. So these guys are all ready to go now. We will go ahead and take a look at the configurations and approve them into the uh, orchestrator here. Um, I'll approve this one. I deployed the latest version here, so I don't have to do a software upgrade this time at all. And for this guy, I know that their data center is somewhere in Los Angeles so we will go ahead and get this guy ready to go and here single internet branch in this case and for now on the land side 59.4 one down from the management interface. That's one. Eventually, this will take over as 59.1 and be the default once we get that changed. And here, I will have to get one of my public IPs from this data center. That guy will be that. Way of 177. Not going to turn up labels yet. And in this case, I'll show you. I'm going to give this a gig. I'll calc it. Give it a 20 meg license. Next. In this case, I'm good. I'll automatically advertise the land side routes to the Pacific and apply that. While that's applying, we'll approve this guy as well.
central single internet branch. Seventy dot five dot twenty four. 70.1, and if uh, you remember from the last video, uh, Orchestrator, well, actually even here, ends up at 70.50, so that's in the same subnet there. And this is also, oops, we got a zero. Both of them. There we go. And here we'll grab the central and let that go. And one thing I forgot to do here, um, <laughs> this guy landed in central uh, as well. So in here, just a simple change group. Again, these groups don't uh, do anything. They're just uh, hierarchy purpose. So we'll get that guy moved over to west, where it belongs. So we moved him over to west. Uh, we'll notice I forgot to leave the labels turned down here when I set this guy up, which I guess is okay. It's the only Silver Peak uh, available at this point. Um, so now, what we're going to do is go ahead and take a look at the configuration from a deployment perspective. So if we edit this guy, <coughs> we can see I left the label on. Everything here looks good. We've got a 20 meg license. I gave the uh, total inbound outbound uh, full one gig, uh, although we probably won't be able to use it, obviously. Let's go ahead and just turn up the label on this guy. Get that tunnel built. And that should really be all I need to get this remote site connectivity to my orchestrator. I'm not allowing the 70 network on my VPN between these two sites. So um, this should be fine. The land site interface should realize, hey, I can reach orchestrator and uh, get connected up here. And while this is going on, if we want to watch it, we should be able to look at our tunnels here. This is our underlay. And if we look at our overlay, yeah, most of them are up and coming here, home and sakes to home. So I would expect that shortly here, this guy will go uh, dark black here and be connected to orchestrator as well. In addition, if we look at our routes, we should see, let's just look at sakes quick. We are not seeing the 70 network. So that would tell me we are not advertising these local land side subnets. So uh, likewise over here doesn't look like we're learning about uh, sites either. So that's actually going to prevent that from happening. So let's use a template to get that taken care of quick. Here, we'll recreate our routing template, pull up the routes here, make sure that that's checked, and as far as our route map, we can leave that alone for now. We don't need a route map to advertise the local lane side. We'll save that and then we will do our home and sites, add routing, get that going. As soon as that pushes, we should see those routes show up. 
jump back over here. Look at just Sykes. There, we see it already. So that should clear that up. And here, one other thing we'll notice on the alarms. You've got this ping for SP-IPSLA down as well. And uh, that is simply because I've told this Sykes device to use my local DNS servers as its uh, DNS lookup. Uh, those are in a network that currently still isn't being advertised. So um, thus the alarm here. I'm going to go ahead and create a new uh, template for that. We'll call it Sykes Default. And we'll just basically make a copy of the actual default admin distance shaper management services and session management and I don't need to make any changes to any of this uh, other than the DNS. So I'm just going to slide all of these down one. I'm going to add 59.251. That's my local domain controller there at Sykes so that it has something to look up to. Uh, now we'll go over to here, Sykes. We will remove the default and add this guy and apply that. So now that I've got that applied, I want to get my home network set up so that I can create the adjacency and advertise my networks over to Sykes uh, for all the rest of the connectivity in and out of the environment. Here, uh, that's handled by a Cisco FTD firewall, as I previously mentioned. So. We'll get that set up quick and make sure those networks are being advertised. So here, if I look at my deployment, I can see I want to create a BGP adjacency between this dot five and this dot one. Um, if I go to my firewall here, here to routing. The reason I chose BGP here is because I've already got BGP uh, set up here. I'm using this as a fusion router for my SDA environment. So rather than set up a whole different routing protocol and worry about redistribution, um, I'm just going to go ahead and set this up. So uh, 65003 is what I'll target and we'll add a new neighbor here. 70.5003. Enable that. And I believe that should be everything I need there. So we'll deploy that. While that's deploying, we will come back over here and go to BGP this guy, turn it on, and I'll just use my inside address, add up here, 70.1, off lane 0, I think that was 2, wasn't it? This is going to be branch it's up. I'm going to use the default uh, distribution profiles here. So BGP to BGP. Add that. Save it. And as soon as the FTD pushes its config, we should see that uh, come up and see the routes here. I didn't pay attention to timers and stuff. Um, 
but hopefully they match. We'll find out. And there we have it. It did come right up. Now if we look at our routes here, we should see we are learning all sorts of these 172.16 route from the SDA environment. And in here we should also see a 172, or excuse me, a 192.168.69 network. Um, that's the, where the rest of the land sits, but I am not. So I'm assuming I'll need to re-advertise connected on the FTD here. So we'll take a look at that. Connected. refresh this. We picked up a few more here. There it is. So now if we go back over to Sykes we should see that all of those networks are being brought into our SD-WAN but they are not. And that is simply because we did not add that route map uh, for the SD WAN. So, in this scenario, we'll go back to our template and go to our routing template. And in here, if we notice, there's nothing here. Um, so, we're not allowing any of those routes that we learned to be sent on to the SD WAN. So, here we'll come over here route redistribution maps, SD-WAN fabric, notice we don't have any here, so we'll do, let's call it SD-WAN, and we will allow, obviously, local static, and we will also allow BGP, and I'll save that, notice it's going to apply to two appliances, once that gets pushed out, we should then see all those routes show up here. And it didn't because I, of course, forgot to set that. So here, doesn't do me any good to create it, but not actually use it. So now that that's there, that some time to push. We can see what's going on here. Now that that's pushed, when we refresh, sure enough, here at Sykes, now we're seeing all of these networks. The next thing we need to do is move Sykes into the data path, so to speak. Um, right now, if we recall the deployment, it is sitting at dot four with a next hop of dot one, dot one being the current uh, firewall that uh, has a site to site VPN between the sites. So in this scenario, we will need to switch this to dot one, which of course would create an IP conflict um, there and remove our next stop because at this point there's no routed networks uh, within that environment behind it it's just that 59 network so here I'll go ahead and save these changes and then in the firewall I will shut down that interface here's our 59.1 I'm just going to disable it, save the changes, deploy that, and then the next issue I have is, of course, that this site-to-site -site VPN still exists. So, in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and delete this VPN from both of the devices so that we don't have any routing issues there. I'll have to wait to deploy that till the previous deployment is done. 
now that that's complete, that VPN tunnel is gone, and the connectivity between me and that location should all be flowing over the SD-WAN. So if I start a ping, and I'll pull this over, we can see my ping from my machine across is working. If I go back over to Orchestrator here, I cancel that, and I look at my flows. This guy, of course, uh, when I took that VPN tunnel down, he's trying to figure himself out right now as to which interface to contact Orchestrator on. Uh, but it is all up. If I look at my flows here, I can see I've got a number of them, right? I've got my domain controllers talking here. Um, that was my ping I just did. Uh, some HTTPS to Orchestrator. Uh, from my management interface uh, of the uh, Silver Peak DNS request, etc. So, seeing some real flows, everything looks to be working properly. And I'll go ahead and give this a uh, minute to come back online um, once it you know realizes that the connectivity had changed uh, in the way that it needs to reach out to Orchestrator here. While I wait for that, uh, just to show some of the traffic here. So, here um, it's being marked as Idea Farm, but this is a uh, this is my ESX host at Sykes, and this is my vCenter here. So, um, you can see here uh, as well that uh, it thinks this went disconnected. Um, it should come right back. I can ping it and everything, so it's not an issue there. Just uh, a matter of uh, you know the connections re-establishing through the Silver Peak as opposed to across that VPN. So I realized I made a rookie mistake here. Um, I uh, set the public IP on the like, Silver Peak to an address that was already in use actually by my ESX host. Um, I've got it set up so I can hit it via public IP direct and get logged into it. It's ACL off so it can only uh, be accessed from my home here but completely forgot about that so I had to go in and change the public IP here which of course is going to cause all of the tunnels uh, to rebuild so here we can see the errors if I look at the tunnels this guy is still targeting 178 although I know if I open up Sykes that it is currently been moved to 179 and here in a little bit, uh, once the changes get pushed uh, to my local Silver Peak, it'll rebuild the tunnels here and everything will come back online. So we can see this came back up, but uh, I did have a number of issues I had to work through here. Um, previously, that site-to-site -site tunnel had a set of rules in here, these VPN rules that were allowing any, any, uh, between these two sites, it was wide open. Um, when I made this change, the traffic to that site was no longer going over the VPN, obviously, and thus the firewall rule set no longer um, applied. I was seeing a lot of uh, unidirectional traffic in my flows in Orchestrator, and that was simply because the traffic was being allowed across from Sykes, but being blocked by my firewall here. So um, in addition to that, right, we saw the routing issue where I had to redistribute connected, um, that sort of stuff. So uh, again, I, I shot from the hip here uh, in this video in bringing all of this up, didn't do any prior planning. And sure enough, the routing aspect of things here definitely got to me. So again, most of the time spent troubleshooting, not really SD-WAN issues in this case, firewall issues, routing, routing issues. And I identified that I still have some routing issues here. I ended up with uh, a number of routes being advertised here that I didn't want. One of which being the default route as well. So if I look over here at Sykes and I look at my default routes, yes, I have my local uh, that's on WAN 0. 
but I'm also seeing that I'm advertising a default route from the home Silver Peak as well. That's not, you know, something I want in this scenario, nor do I really want uh, this uh, 169 either. So, you know, if I go look at the routes based on BGP, anything that came in via BGP, and I take a look at these, yes, I want this, that, all of these 16s, but I really wouldn't want these two. So, you know, a number of ways to handle that, right? I could create a route map on, or modify the route map uh, here as to what's being advertised into the SD-WAN. I could create a BGP uh, route map on this guy that blocks those routes. Uh, from being advertised. In addition to that, I could obviously come over to the firewall here and modify that uh, BGP data with a route map, you know, to make sure that those didn't get advertised at all. So lots of ways to handle the routing like there would be in any, you know, WAN type network. But in this case, for now, I'm going to leave these. They aren't hurting anything. If I try to get to the internet from Sykes, uh, I, I'm fairly positive at this point that that traffic should not be traversing across the SD-WAN and back out my internet connection. So if I look at my flows here at Sykes and look for anything internet bound, which unfortunately right now I don't see anything internet bound here, so we'll have to go test that out. So I went ahead and jumped into my domain controller over there, started a ping to the internet here. You can see we are using pass-through on INET1. It's not sending this back to my local site here. Uh, you know, if I look here, I would not see that 8.8 uh, traffic. So um, even though I'm advertising in that default route, uh, it wouldn't come into play unless, uh, for whatever reason, these pass-through tunnels to the Internet went down, in which case chances are the Internet would be down and they'd be completely disconnected anyway. Here we see some other traffic uh, off the Windows box uh, as well. So everything's looking good at this point. I could clean up that routing, although it's not hurting me right now. And we can start to see here now that we've got some real traffic. Uh, we see, you know, DNS jumping into the critical apps uh, overlay bio. We've got some default, obviously, internet traffic. This is all traffic between my uh, vCenter and the ESX host there. Uh, we've got some real time. It looks like uh, I categorized this as WebEx, although that's going to the internet. Nonetheless, we can see here plenty of flows with just very few machines in that scenario. Here's my RDP session to that box that I'm used to start the ping, that sort of stuff. So, But now that this is up, let's jump back to the dashboard and we truly have internet connectivity uh, essentially all the way across the United States. If I click on all of my appliances here, you know, I can see the top talkers, who's doing what, a whole bunch of information, and then I can get into this health map. Now, when I look at this, I'm going to highlight one of these, click on it, and it's going to tell me, hey, you know what, uh, latency is the issue here, right? That's why these are red. thinks that the latency is too high between these sites. If I look at all the other ones, if I were to take latency off here, I would see most things look green. Uh, we had some loss here as I, you know, made some changes and stuff. But otherwise, really, latency is the only thing that it's complaining about. So in my environment, I'm going to assume that this is uh, just the way it is, right? I'm looking at, you know, 66... 70, I guess it doesn't really go over 70 uh, milliseconds on latency. So in this scenario, I would probably want to go in knowing that I can't fix this, right? This is just internet connectivity. Uh, I would have to go in and modify these values so that uh, I basically made this look like 70 is okay. So to fix that up, 
if I go back to my dashboard here and I take a look at the health map here I've got a little cog I can take a look at this and look at my thresholds right so this is 20 milliseconds to 50 for yellow anything under 20 is green in my environment then what I would want to do is set this to let's say 80 and this to 65 and now we've got 0 to 65 is green 65 to 80 is orange warning and then above 80 is going to be red if I save that on my next polls right I'm looking at an hourly here this should go back to green uh, assuming I don't see anything here um, at the time so we'll give that some time and come back and check it in a little bit just like we did before if I highlight both of these look at the tunnel live health look at the default uh, overlay and here we can see our bandwidth utilization between the two of course there's not much going on right now if I look at my loss it looks good jitter should look good as well latency we'll see you know roughly that 60 millisecond uh, latency that I was seeing but otherwise everything between the two sites looks pretty good okay so it's been a few hours here and now you can see uh, these all did go green we're good to go there the other thing I did was in the background deployed the AWS Silver Peak so I have it up and running I can get to it via its public uh, IP that's tied to the management interface here I've already assigned WAN 0 LAN 0 got their IP addresses or excuse me their MAC addresses uh, tied as well put in my licensing and now if I go to the orchestrator of course we see here that uh, it was discovered I already upgraded this to 922 uh, in the background with the same way we've done it before here so now if I do an approval I'll skip this our group here is going to be east this is in Columbus Ohio password just call it and I'll call it this what the heck now here we're going to switch to router single internet branch and for the IP address I need to go identify what IP address is assigned to the uh, land side and the land side here so over in my AWS account if I look at my network interfaces um, I gave them information here in a description so I knew which one was which and the IP address here is 209 if I copy that and I think this is a WAC 20 and the next hop into AWS I think it's going to be 32.1 if I look at my subnets yeah it's in that guy so there's that one then if we go back to the WAN side In here we'll look at this guy he is here and over here that is also a web 20 and if I jump over to my subnets again we will see that he is in this same subnet so we will give him the same gateway and 
and then I'm going to leave this off for now. This will be one gig. And our license will be 20 meg. Get through this. This will be Eastern. Apply that. So now we can see this guy's coming in here. Uh, connected to Cloud Portal, not quite connected to Orchestrator yet because obviously we don't have any tunnels up. We're not receiving any routes or advertising any routes. We're going to give this a uh, couple of minutes and then I'll go ahead and turn up that tunnel and we'll set up a, a network advertisement for AWS here. Okay, so one thing we will notice here, I'm going to jump back into this configuration wizard. And this seems a little weird, uh, and I'm sure this may just be my lack of knowledge on AWS in the way that it does uh, all of its routing and networking, um, but both our LAN and WAN side interfaces are in the exact same uh, subnet, which seems a little odd, but that in my deployment here, I guess, just is what it is. So... Like I said before, <laughs> these two are in the same subnet now. I've assigned an elastic IP to this side, so it does have its own you know, public IP address. One thing I did forget to do here uh, is check this box. This will tell the Silver Peak that, hey, this WAN side, it's behind that, um, which of course in AWS Azure, it, it essentially has to be. Um, so from that perspective, we'll go ahead and while we're here, turn up this uh, label and apply this. So we can see here that our tunnels all came up. We're all connected. However, we still can't reach Orchestrator. And that's simply because of routing, yet again. When we look at this uh, AWS for routes, I can see I'm learning all the routes from all the other sites, as I would expect. But we are not advertising the LAN subnets. And I've got this uh, default uh, RT map to sub SH here that's basically saying, hey, Allow local static OSPF and BGP, but that, of course, is only going to apply to routes that we have down here. So in this case, I could just simply go add that routing template, which would advertise the local land side subnet. But my AWS instance is broken up into three subnets. And again, I don't know a lot about AWS. It did this when I built uh, all my AWS. I've got three WAC20s. I know they all live here. And in this case, if I look at my VPC as a whole, I see that this is indeed the whole WAC16 that I've got. So 172.31.0.0.16. Uh, in this case, I'm going to add a route manually. 172.16.31.0.0.16. Did man tree? Oh, zero zero sixteen. Zero zero sixteen. Next hop is going to be the next hop off my land side subnet. So that is going to be the one seven two three one thirty two one. Whoops, it's supposed to be land zero. And we'll add that. So when we save this, now if I look at home, I should see that WAC 20, or excuse me, WAC 16 show up here in short order. And there it is. And we're learning it from AWS. So now we know that's the case. That should fix up our connectivity to Orchestrator here shortly once it realizes that it has a path to, uh, well, the return traffic comes back uh, in this case being that I didn't know about it. 
that advertisement would hit my home silver peak who would advertise it on to my uh, firewall and kind of close the loop there so and I did a refresh and sure enough here this guy cleared up I do have a machine sitting in AWS behind this just a little Ubuntu Linux box that I should now have direct connectivity to from my site here at home and it should also be able to get to some of the sites resources you will notice uh, these little icons change right this clearly AWS these are virtual physical appliances have uh, their own as well so now if I pull this over here, we can see that I can indeed ping Orchestrator. I can ping one of my internal domain controllers. I can ping the Psych Sites domain controller. If I look at my flows here, should see some traffic. Yep all my ICMP traffic going to Sykes, going to home. Let's take a look at our latency here. We don't have any one hour data yet, obviously. Just brought it up. So here are trends. Let's take a look real time between AWS and my house. Looking at right at 42 okay and then if we go AWS to Sykes looking like that's averaging about 73 so I assume when I come back I'll have to adjust my dashboard again chances are we will see in here this go to yeah we're already seeing it here so I'll probably have to bump up the uh, latency again um, just knowing that those are my averages I can't you know make it go any faster or anything so uh, in the health map here. I'll just leave this overnight and pick it up tomorrow and we'll see what happens. So before I shut down here last night, I went ahead and deployed the Azure Silver Peak as well. Uh, got it up and running. We can see all four of them are up. Tunnels are all built. Everything looks good. Uh, however, our health map here, um, as we suspected, you know, from last night to this morning, we're seeing latency uh, alarms here. So if I go take a look at the latency between the sites to kind of try to figure out where uh, I need to adjust this health map if I want to make sure that everything looks green under what is normal operation, I can go to monitoring and latency trends select a couple of appliances here let's start with home and AWS and if I look at the four hour view one day view we can kind of see this is pretty stable 40 we kind of already took care of that if I look at home to Azure see pretty similar right around that 40 mark and then home to Sykes. And there was that 60 that made us change it the first time. If I look at AWS to Azure, I see kind of a different story. Let me jump back to the four hour here, right? So we're kind of all over the board, oddly enough, up to 80 milliseconds uh, at certain times there and then AWS to Sykes 72 to 73 really is where that's at then Azure to Sykes we see pretty good time as well so 
for now, I'm just going to go change this and set the bottom end at 75. Not sure if that'll do it or not with the way that uh, Azure, oddly enough, Azure and AWS are the, the weakest link here. And we'll give that some time and see what happens if that keeps me green. So now uh, I can prove I have connectivity between all of these sites. If I open a command prompt here uh, from my home site, uh, I can obviously ping uh, 59, as a domain controller in uh, Sykes. If I ping 10.0.0.5, Five, that is a uh, virtual machine, uh, or is it six? Yeah, six is a uh, Linux Ubuntu VM running in Azure. And then that is a Linux box running in AWS. So I've got connectivity uh, all the way through, and everything uh, is up and running. And in addition to that, I had a backup, a Veeam backup of my uh, domain controller at the Sykes location kick off. So here, if I look at this, it kicked off about oh, between 7.50 and 8 o'clock, pegged out my 20 meg, and just finished here now. So I can see that that throughput is working and everything transfer-wise is hitting that 20 meg mark I would expect with my license. So the last thing I want to show here is boost, our WAN acceleration. So in order to do that, I am going to create a new business intent overlay based on SIFS traffic, and I'm going to transfer a 350 meg file from my home site to my site site between my Veeam machine and the domain controller there. And in order to do that, I want to create a new business intent overlay in this scenario because I don't want to enable boost on the default overlay as it sits today. That would apply to a lot of traffic and may not be the best thing. In a lot of cases, you can get away with enabling it for just the bulk apps uh, bio and you know get a lot of uh, efficiency out of it. But for my test, I'm going to create a new bio and I'm going to just key in on that SIFS traffic via ACL. So to do that, I'm going to go to my templates and for my default template, I'm just going to add access lists here and I will, huh, I can use this new ACL, there's no rules to it, so I'm going to add a rule. Instead of match everything, I want to match SIFs. I'll save that. Now, this is just going to push that ACL to the appliances. It's not going to um, use it for anything yet. We still have to go create the bio and tell it to use that. So uh, my Sykes default, I will also add the access list. Give it the same name. There. So that should be pushing out to those appliances. Now, if I create a new bio, I'll just call it boosted. And in here, all of the same applies. We have to add our label. In here, I'm going to choose the new ACL. I'm going to make this high throughput. I'm not going to enable boost yet. Um, I want to be able to show you know, how long this file transfer took before boost and then how long it took after. So uh, from that perspective, I'm going to leave that alone. And in here, I want to add my breakout locally. I net one to make that all the same. 
we'll hit OK. Notice I moved it up above the default overlay. Save that. Now, a couple other things I need to do. I need to make sure to apply this overlay to the sites. Now, in my scenario here, the only two sites that really need it are these two, uh, home and sites. So I'll just add it to those two. And that will get pushed. Then the next thing I need to do is make sure that these appliances have been assigned some boost. So in here, we can see that here. Um, in my case, I know I have it, so I'm going to give them a full uh, 20 meg of boost on each appliance. Same sites. So now that those have all been deployed, um, we'll go ahead and do this uh, data transfer test. Um, keep in mind, even though we've configured everything uh, from the appliance perspective and the bio, um, we have not enabled boost on this bio. So right now, nothing uh, will be you know, boosted anyway. So it'll be a raw data transfer that we'll see. If I pull my VM over here, um, I'm just going to grab this PRTG installer that I uh, had downloaded was sitting in my downloads folder here and I am going to send it over to the Sykes DC and in the background I'm just going to start a clock here uh, as far as how long this is going to take. So if I do a control V and start the timer we will see this uh, start to transfer. I'll pause the video, wait for it to stop, and then we'll do this again with boost turned on once we're done here. And we can see we're racing to the finish here. So two minutes, 45 seconds uh, is what that transfer took. So I'm going to go ahead and delete it here on the far side. Now we'll go back over to our orchestrator and I will enable boost for this uh, overlay. We'll let that deploy to the appliances. Okay, so that's been deployed and we'll do this same thing here. We'll grab this file and I will get my stopwatch ready. So in this case, it's kicked off. Uh, one of the things we can do here as well is when we go back and we look at our flows, one of the things we can look at are the flows that are being boosted. So here we can see that uh, these flows are in the boosted overlay, but they're also um, being boosted as flows. So from that perspective, we know that it's... Uh, actively you know boosting those flows in here there is also some information about boost that we can look at to see how efficient and how much uh, it's, it's actually boosting as well so we'll take a look at that here uh, as well So we're headed to the end here, and what we're going to find out here, this first transfer, is roughly the exact same time frame, right? Two minutes, 45 seconds. So um, now, however, if I delete this, And I do it again. Oops. We should see this next run be way quicker. So here we can kind of see it racing to the end here. And my end time was 48 seconds. So boost works just like any LAN acceleration, right? It's network dedupe, etc. So 
in this scenario uh, after we had transferred it the first time it kind of remembered it but uh, you know when we look at things like backup where we might be transferring a lot of the same data night after night after night uh, this can make a huge difference in the amount of time it would take to do those backups and, and that sort of stuff so and then as I was mentioning earlier, you can kind of look at uh, what Boost is doing. Um, if I were to look at the Boost summary here, um, I'm looking at a granularity of one minute uh, for the past hour, roughly. Looking at Silver Peak Home, I guess I can look at the Sakes as well. Uh, but really from home, um, we see the total Boost bytes of 380.5 meg um, in what it used. So. Uh, we can kind of tell if we have more data trying to be boosted than we have uh, boost applied to the uh, appliance. Um, you'll start to see these uh, percent and minute insufficient boost, meaning that hey, uh, there's you know we need more um, in order to be effect as effective as we can be here.